with a, a short uh, story that gets you in the mindset of the, this book I'm about to go through. Uh, there was a man who was an artist in Texas, and he he created this enormous masterpiece uh, before he died. Uh, it was called The Miracle at Pentecost. Uh, you could look it up online. It was 34 meters long and about 8 to 10 meters high. It's an enormous painting. And he wanted to leave it behind as uh, something that he had completed that people in following generations could look at and uh, point them towards God, but he also wanted to be remembered by this piece of art. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. But it, it, it did get a little bit strange when it, his statements about it got a little bit odd. You know, when we do things, sometimes we, we have good intentions, but you know, in the, the passenger seat, there can be some other ideas as well. It's human nature, I guess. And in this, this, this piece of art, what he said about it was, started to get a little bit odd, like I said, and even when he died, he said he wanted to be buried next to it so he could be kind of watching over it. It was the, the monument of his life, and he wanted to be remembered by everyone for it. A couple of years ago, I think in 2013, uh, the Museum of Biblical Art had a fire, and it was burned down, uh, not completely, but there was a fire just in the area where that piece of art was, and it was destroyed. The insurance companies declared it a loss. In an interview with uh, his daughter, they asked her, you know, he always wanted to be remembered by this. He even was buried nearby to watch over it. Do you think, I don't know what kind of reporter asked this question, but they asked pretty directly, you know, what do you think about that? And she said in typical Texas fashion, didn't do him much good. And uh, that kind of puts us in the tone of this. And you know, a lot of us in this room, I'd say a great portion of us are uh, in education. Uh, we have also a lot of small business owners and people in ministry. This, most of us are, are in this boat. When we're looking forward to the new year, with our families and our burdens. Sometimes it's not all cheery. We're looking forward and there's difficulty. Happy New Year. <laughs> I wanna to go to mine directly uh, right now. see the first three points here. I'm going to get to them in a minute. So uh, again, if you've just walked in, my name is Mike Forster. Uh, I am not the pastor here, Pastor Miller. Again, if you're just walking in, he's in the Philippines. And a couple of us were asked to fill in for him. I'd like to start the new year with uh, Ecclesiastes. No one's walking out. This is a good sign, okay? The, the stated author, he identifies himself as Kohelet. The Kohelet is a, a Hebrew, it means the person who gathers people together uh, in the assembly, to the assembly. It has this meaning of someone who gathers people together. He identifies himself as a son of David, a king in, Jeru a king in Jerusalem, a king over Israel in Jerusalem wiser than anyone who had ruled in Jerusalem before him, a great builder of projects and being of incredible wealth. Uh, we translate Kohelet usually as uh, the teacher or the preacher. I will just refer to him as the teacher this morning. When he talks about all of the things he accomplishes in this book, when he talks about uh, who he claims to be, he is giving us his resume. He is giving us his credentials. He's about to say some things that are not what we typically read in the Bible. So before he says those things, he is establishing who he is and why he can say it. He is basically saying, I have mastered life. I am at the top of the food chain. 
I have reached the very, the very pinnacle of success. You can't be more successful than I am. I have accomplished more than anyone else. I am wiser than anyone before me. These are the things that he says throughout the book. And he's not being arrogant. These things are, are true. And he has something to say. In this book, he teaches many things, and I, we're going to look at three. And these are those three things I'd like to look at. He will expose the, the meaninglessness of life. And I'm going to add a caveat. He will do that apart from the fear of God, so no one runs out of the room. Okay? He was going to do that apart from the fear of God. But he is not going to say that in the beginning. He is going to expound the meaning of life in light of the fear of God. And we're going to talk about this phrase, fear of God. It's kind of archaic, and we don't necessarily uh, feel very comfortable with the term. But we're going to talk about that a little bit later. And he'll explain how to live with you know, points one and two in mind. I think this is applicable for our new year. The three E's, they're, they're in honor of Mr. Miller, who likes to use things in threes. Okay. How do I use this? Do I hit this button? No? How about that button? I don't want to click on the, there we go. All right. The meaning of the next life. He's going to make a number of arguments that life is meaningless. Now, this argument that life is meaningless, it's a, it's a kind of a literary foil. As many of you know, a literary foil is a way to talk about this, but before you talk about this, you are going to explain something over here that is the opposite. In some sense, it's very different. It can be a character or a theme, a subplot. In literature, a foil is, they're going to talk about this, this is the foil, and it's very different than this. But first you have to explain, you know, how different this is so that you can clearly understand this one. All right? In the first two chapters, that is what he is doing. With that in mind, he describes the meaninglessness of normal life with no regard to God in order to bring the reader towards life with me. And later he'll describe how to live a life that is worthwhile. All right? He's going to argue that in certain life, in everything that humans do has no meaning. All right. He will discuss the meaninglessness of life itself, the meaninglessness of secular, worldly wisdom and knowledge, the meaninglessness of self-indulgent pleasure, the meaninglessness of materialism, and the meaninglessness of just working too much and being a perfectionist. Let's look at a short uh, overview of his arguments. We're going to look at a couple of his arguments now. If you could open up your Bible to chapter 1, verse 2 of Ecclesiastes. So chapter 1, verse 2. I'll be reading from the NIV, though um, often for poetry, I would really recommend another version, perhaps an NET, something like that, which, which makes a little bit more sense. Sometimes I'm going to talk about another version in order to bring a point home. Okay, this is chapter 1, verse 2. Meaningless. Meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors in which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. Better yet, the NET reads, uh, earth remains the same through the ages. Uh, NASB or, or King James will read uh, Vanity of Vanities. Another good one is Futility of Futilities. Everything is futile. 
He's saying that everything that people do ultimately has no meaning. This really has bothered people through the millennia. Before uh, the Christian church ever started, some Jews were also bothered by this. They're wondering, what can this mean? Let's continue with verse 9. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was, it was here already, long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. Uh, basically saying whatever what, whatever is going to happen this year is going to be a, something that will ha has happened before in some way. It won't be anything new. The same way we're not very familiar with our great-great-grandfather, our great-great-grandchildren won't be very familiar. In fact, they might even forget us completely. You'll see this theme repeated over and over, and it seems really, really, really negative. It even seems to contradict other parts of the Bible. There is some truth to it, but it's this very harsh, realistic view of life that it seems to be also missing something. But again, you have to remember, he is preparing us for something else. He is describing life over here in order to make life over here more clear. Let's look at the rest of his arguments. He's going to talk about the meaninglessness of secular accomplishment. What I mean is the meaningless of getting things done, getting awards, rewards, the ultimate meaning. When I say meaningless, you have to remember, he's looking at the, he's a king, he's describing himself as a king. He's describing himself as King Solomon or as like King Solomon. And so when he's looking at life, he's not looking at today, he's looking at life in this really big picture where he's looking at generations gone by. So when he says things are futile, when things are meaningless, he's looking at it like that. All right, he goes on to say, this is in verse 14, chapter 1, verse 14. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, chasing after the wind. Now, this is better understood. I have thought about everything that man has ever done. I find all of his, all of his accomplishments to be futile, meaninglessness. The chasing after the wind, that's, it has this idea of like trying to, to hug a cloud. 